This episode of Author Stories is brought to you by the Writing Mastery Academy. Founded by Jessica Brody, author of the best-selling plotting guide, Save the Cat Writes a Novel. The Writing Mastery Academy features online, on-demand writing courses, including the official Save the Cat Writes a Novel companion course. Novel fast drafting, crafting dynamic characters, and productivity hacks for writers to name just a few, plus monthly live webinars on various writing topics. Go to jessicabrody.com slash hank to learn more and get your first month of unlimited access to all the content for just $6. That's right, just $6. jessicabrody.com slash hank. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Lissa Evans on the show with me. She has an amazing new book. It's called V for Victory. And, you know, if you love historical fiction the way I do, uh, this is a must have uh, for your uh, to be read pile. You know, if you have a a comfy reading chair or you like to read in bed uh, at night before going off to sleep this it, you need to have this beside you where you can pick it up and and just fall in love with the story the way i have um welcome to the show lissa thank you very much indeed well lissa we begin each show with the same question and that question is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller oh goodness me um I come from a family where we all read a lot. I mean, a lot. I, I mean, I, I, I was in my teens before I realised that most families don't actually read through meals. But I think the first time I wrote, uh, the first time I really remember was I was about six and we were supposed to write a story in class. And I wrote a story about a hippo called Fred. I have no idea why. But I actually illustrated it. I'm not, I'm not a, in any way artistic, but I drew a picture of a hippo at the top. And I drew an arrow pointing to his head and I wrote Fred's head by it. And I remember thinking, that is so funny. That That is the funniest thing that's ever been written. And I remember then thinking, oh, it's lovely writing. It's lovely writing something funny, especially. So that was a, a memory of my first story, really, but also my first joke, because a lot of what I write has humour in it. That, I love that so much. And I, I have this vivid picture uh, of meal times with everyone reading, and uh, I, I love that so much. <laughs> yes. So, Lisa, when did you know that you were going to be a writer? Um, you know, sometimes uh, it's it's sometime in adolescence, and this this need to tell stories comes out, and then invariably, you know, we get sidetracked with uh, you know career and raising families and all of that sort of thing. But but the love of writing comes back around uh, to us. And, and I know you have an interesting story of how you came to that. But but when did you first know that you this was something that you were going to do? I have notebooks stretching back to when I was about seven years old. I think I was always aware that writing would probably be for me, the most important thing I could ever do would be the best thing I could ever do. Stories and reading has always infused my life. And I've always written stories. So when I was at school, you know, writing, writing stories in English classes was always the thing I enjoyed most. And I wrote the school magazine. And when I say that, I did. I wrote the, <laughs> the whole school magazine. And then <laughs> I, I, I wrote the whole school pantomime. But, but I didn't. I think I, I had no idea how one would become a writer or, or sell a novel. We didn't know anybody like that. And sure. I actually went to university to study medicine. And um, I carried on writing odd things in notebooks while I was there. But that was, you know, five years study and I became a doctor. And um, and while I was I, I, I split my time between doing medicine and being in a comedy group, um, I had no ambitions beyond medicine at that point. But it became rapidly 
clear once I'm qualified that um, I really did not enjoy it in any way and was scared stiff most of the time. And I spent four pretty unhappy years feeling very inadequate as a junior doctor. And and then I, I decided that practically overnight that I, I had to give up, really. You couldn't hate something that much and be any good at it. And there's no point in being a bad doctor. So, right. <laughs> so I gave up medicine and I thought, well, what can I do? I'm, you know, I was 25 by this point. And I wasn't qualified for anything else. The only thing I had done apart from that was writing sketches and performing in a sketch show and I'm not much a performer but I've written reasonably funny stuff I suppose but um what I ended up doing was applying for a job in BBC Radio in their life entertainment department uh which department that makes everything from sketch shows to adaptations to quiz shows to panel shows and I got a job in that and for five years I was a radio producer and I think during that time, what I learned was editing, um, which is probably the single most useful thing any writer can ever learn, how to make something concise. In radio, you obviously you only have the words and and therefore they've got to be as concise, as perfect as possible. And constructing jokes as well is something that's very precise. The, the rhythm of it, the musicality of it is all inherent in a joke. And so I learned to to edit the writing of others. And uh, that was a, a useful skill stored up. And I was still writing old things in notebooks, but not doing anything, not doing anything longer. And I went to TV. This all sounds very long, but it was really because I didn't actually start writing my first book till I was 39. And by that time I'd been in telly about five or six years producing and directing. But I had sort of had enough of that, really. Um, television is staffed by very young, enthusiastic people. And by that point, I was feeling old and not very enthusiastic. And I think my, the thing I'd always wanted to do by then was calling me. And I think what the key was that I found something I wanted to write about. And a very, very good friend of mine had died. And he had, he had lived next door to me. We'd been very good pals. And I inherited his pets and um, took two very fat cats. And I wanted to write about about grief, really. And I ended up writing a novel, which I suppose you could call a funny book about grief. That does sound weird. But it was a, a tribute to my friend. And it was a tribute to that feeling of stuckness you get when you're, when you're grieving and about how people move on. And I think that was what tipped me into writing at, at 39, something I really wanted to write about. And from from then on, that was my main aim. I still did television for a while because, you know, I had to eat. And then I, I subsequently you know, married married quite late and had kids. So, you know, supporting the kids was part of it. But from then on, I would consider myself a writer. That's quite a long story. Sorry. No, no, that was perfect. Um, listen, you, you mentioned that that funny book about grief. Um, in, in reading your work and in, in V for Victory, uh, especially you – you have an interesting way of taking a a situation, a time period, a a, a photograph of uh, of life during a particular time, and allowing us to look at it in a different way. Um, it you know there, there's there's a lot of historical fiction, especially about this time period, that's out in the market right now, and we're having. Um, you know, definitely a, a, a renaissance, if you want to look at it that way, for for this type of of time period literature, um, and and the reading public definitely has a hunger for this, um, but very few books allow us to look at it through a little different lens. Like there, there's lots of serious uh, historical fiction about World War II, um, but very few of those allow us to. To let that side of our humanity come through. Um, yeah. What is it about humor um, that you find so interesting? And uh, you know, is is it is it wrong for us to try to find the humor in uh, you know stressful situations? Uh, no, I don't think it is. And it's, I think for me, this is the way I write, and 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 that's another perhaps a reason. Uh, why I didn't really start writing till later on. I was searching for the way I write. And the way I write is to find humour in everything. That doesn't mean peppering it with jokes. Um, there are great stretches of the book where funny things are not happening. But if there is a 
chance to show irony or to have some wit in dialogue that is what i will always go for and it fits very well with a time in which people did find the the human situations because otherwise you simply couldn't go on and then you know that's more than that dark wit um that you hear in 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 uh, writing about authentic writing about the second world war really inspired me i mean i i I think a lot of it is to do with the amount of research I did, because although I'd always been interested in what's known as the home front here, I don't know whether the phrase is known in the US, that's basically civilian life during the sure. Second World War. And I had read, I, I, I read a book on that one very um, early on. When I was about 13, my father was given a book called How We Lived Then, which was life in the home front. And my, my father said to my sister who bought it for him, why do I need to read that? I, I lived through it because it was he had he'd been a young man in the war. But I took the book and I read it and reread it and it fascinated me. It's a it's a book full of detail, things like, you know, what would be in your Christmas stocking, what would you cook, where would you go on holiday, how would you feed your pets, that kind of fact-based stuff that kids love. And I absorbed that and um it gave me a kind of baseline of knowledge so that when I started researching properly for a book. I already had that that feeling that was almost like memories of my own. So I read a lot of stuff that was written during the Second World War. That was my sort of gold standard books that was were written and published during the Second World War, often by emergency workers, um, wardens, um, firemen, ambulance workers. And because they were written and published so quickly, they were so authentic. And the language, you, you know, the language in them is is absolutely right and the observations are what people saw and i love that and what you're not getting is you're not getting considered memories where stuff is filtered out you are getting the the immediate impact of what's going on and for me that helped enormously because once you start viewing a period through the eyes of the people who lived in it i think the plots then become inherent for that period you don't glue stuff on you you live it and and my plots often change from what I think they're going to be because I realised that the characters wouldn't do that, they would do this, because I'm, I'm sort of living through the period with them. So um, I think, you know, that the humour and the, the different way of looking at it comes from my, my research as much as f from my own uh, way of writing. Listen, um, were you always a, a fan of historical fiction or was it just this time period specifically that intrigued you? Just this time period, really. And in fact, I wrote, um, yes, because my first book set in this time period, I wanted to write about, I thought, been thinking about writing a book about behind the scenes in television. And then I thought, oh, who care about that? And then I started, um, I was reading a, a, a biography of a film star between the walls and he had, he was called George Arliss, now forgotten now. But he had said, once work begins in the studio, nothing outside is of any relative importance. And I thought, oh, God, that's so true. Because when you're in a telly studio, the most pathetic, trivial things seem massively important. And I started wondering whether that had been the case when the world outside was falling apart. You know, during the Second World War, with bombs smashing on the studio roof, did it still take 12 people to decide on the colour of a, the lead man's tie? And I started researching, and yes, indeed it did. You know, that, that behind the scenes feeling was exactly the same. And I thought, oh, I can write about this then. This is my world. This is writers. This is actors. This is scripts. But I can set it in, in a world that I'm interested in. So I wrote a, a book about uh, called their, the, their Finest Hour and a Half, which ended up as a film actually called Their Finest about making a film during the second world war and then i went on to write another book about it called crooked heart and that was the start of a loose trilogy which v for victory ends so you can read them all on their own but the second book in the trilogy is set in the 1920s and that was a huge leap for me yeah uh, that was a that was a big jump to, to to go to another era that i hadn't thought about so i don't think i'm a natural writer of historical fiction i'm just a natural writer of world war ii fiction right um, you mentioned that V for Victory is the ending of a loose trilogy that begins with Crooked Heart. When you began writing Crooked Heart, did you see um, that that there would be um, that this would end up being a trilogy? Could you see past the book you were writing to what this this meta story would become? 
only when I got to the end of it, that quite often happens. I'm so I'm living so deeply in the in the characters' heads that sort of I want to know what happens next. So I got to the end of Crooked Heart and thought, oh, I would like to write a sequel. But Crooked Heart begins with a prologue with a little boy living in a large house in London with a an elderly lady who's a former suffragette. And it's a it's it's a it's a short prologue, but it's very in, in a very intense one. And the influence of this suffragette who dies at the end of the prologue infuses the whole of the rest of the book and goes on into V for Victory. And I realised that actually I needed to write the story of this suffragette first. So that's why I jumped backwards to the 1920s and I wrote about former suffragettes. I wrote about what, what do you do next when you change the world? You know, what, 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 what's next for, for people who have, who have moved and shaken everything around them? And uh, so, no, it, it was incremental. I, I started with one book and then realised that gradually there was more in it. And I wanted to tell their story. I, I wanted to revisit them. It's lovely returning to characters. And, and revisiting them because you've already got their voice. And that's so nice. That's so lovely. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy to use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web when you're um when you finish crooked heart and you and you realize that that this is going to be a loose trilogy um e- each of your books stand alone perfectly uh, you can pick up v for victory without having read the other two and it's a completely satisfying novel when you go back and pick up the other two there are threads that run through there that uh, you know are 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 definitely a payoff for the reader. Um, did you set rules for yourself or um, constraints to to work within when when you started conceptualizing how this series would go? And uh, you know how do you maintain the thread uh, throughout the books while also ensuring that they are satisfying reads on their own? Um. When I, st- I'm so pleased you said that about V for Victory because uh, that making that a standalone was obviously the most difficult as the as as the last book of three, but the 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 biggest difficulty for me was um, when I went jumped backwards to the book called Old Baggage, which is about this suffragette. I had already right. written lots about her in Crooked Heart, so I had to make a kind of bible of the woman is called Matty. Um, a Matty Bible, everything about her I'd written in Crooked Heart. I was jumping back 15 years, so it all had to work. And that and that was re- that was really hard because I, I had to think what what would it be like for somebody to read Old Baggage and then go on to Crooked Heart? You don't want to stumble, you don't want to you don't ever want a reader to think, oh that's not right, that doesn't work. And um so all the so all the facts I had about her, I had to make sure was smoothly incorporated. And in fact, the only one that actually proved a problem was for some reason in Crooked Heart, I had given her a doctorate 
And that was, <laughs> I was cursing myself because that was so difficult to explain. It was such an un, unusual thing for a woman in, in the 1920s. Though so she's a remarkable woman. And that was quite hard. But when it, so, and when I moved forward, I had all those characters from two books. And although there were constraints and I had to simplify things, the biggest pleasure was looking through and thinking, oh, who do I want to write about again? Which characters do I want to bring back? Which of the little girls in, in Old Baggage? Because there's a girls club on Hampstead Heath in Old Baggage with girls between 12 and 18. Which of those little girls do I want to see as grown-ups during the Second World War? And that was a, that was a real pleasure, picking and choosing. So I think the only real constraints were, were I had to not write about as many people as I'd like to. It would have been wonderful to have loads of them coming back and, and picking, choosing and seeing remarkable fates for them all. And I couldn't do that. So some of them in, will never know. <laughs> right. In, in V for Victory, um, you take a, uh, a slogan, uh, if you will, um, that that we see on lots of uh, wartime uh, posters and, and things like that, the, the V for victory um, sentiment. Um, and you, you, there's a sort of uh, a, a pun, a, a play on words there uh, with the character of V said, <laughs> um, yes, was that, uh, was that intentional? Oh, well, as soon as I thought of the title, I, I, it made me laugh. And I thought, actually, I could have spelled it VWE, which is her nickname. And uh, my, my, my publisher went, no, 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 no. Um, so, yes, it's a pun that makes me happy. And I'm glad you like it, Hank. But, um, oh, I, I love puns. You, you don't <laughs> even so know. Do I. So do I. But it's not. I, I find it satisfying, but it's it's not inherent in it. <laughs> But I like I like the thought it's there for anyone to spot. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and and as the writer, sometimes you just need these little inside jokes that that maybe they only entertain you, but that's enough. Absolutely, absolutely. yes, you're absolutely <laughs> right. With that. I'm sure there are loads of jokes in my books that nobody gets except me. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, sometimes that's you right. have to do something for yourself. <laughs> that's right. So it's it's late 1944 um, when the when the book opens. Um, set the stage for us. What what's going on in this book? Where do we meet the characters and and uh, you know how do we drop into the story? Well, when I when I started this book, I had already written two books set during the Blitz, which is right at the beginning of the the what the Second World War. It's it's from 1940 to 41, and I had done all my research on the beginning of the war, because I, I never want to know more than my characters. So although I knew a little about, just through general knowledge about the end of the war, I hadn't done any intensive research on it. And the more I read about it, the more fascinating it was. It was an incredibly grueling time to be a Londoner. The war was clearly there to be won. It was going to happen. Um, D-Day had happened in, in, in mid-1944. And we pick up our characters um, in, I think it's, I think it's September or October, and so everybody knows the Allies are going to win. It's going to happen, but it's it's taking a dreadfully long time. And meanwhile, London is getting an unprecedented battering, because after the the Blitz, there had been several years where there was some bombing, but nothing very consistent, and then in summer of 1944, Hitler's first secret weapon. Came along, which people had been predicting for a long time, were the V1, the V1s, and the V1s were pilotless planes that were sprung into the air in uh, Europe, and they were almost like clockwork, except they they, they had you know, petrol engines, but they they would run for a certain amount of time, and then known as doodle bugs, or they were known as um, robot 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 planes and they were absolutely terrifying i only write about them briefly the, the whole book starts with with a doodle bug um the, the last one that people have heard for a, a long time and during that summer of doodle bugs i've seen descriptions of what it was like to be in london because between the engine cutting out and it hitting the ground there were about 12 seconds and if it cut out directly overhead it was quite likely that the bomb would at least fall near you if it passed over you you would be safe and 
the whole of London was listening. There is a cartoon of uh, people walking on the street with all with one enormous ear t- tilted up to the sky. And I've seen a fantastic <laughs> description of somebody saying, you were listening with every part of yourself, like, like a cat listens with its fur. And the tension was indescribable. And then just as the, uh, Britain had found a sort of defence for V1s, they had, them, they had the RAF shooting them down over the channel, they had barrage balloons getting in their way, and they had guns um, hitting them from the coast. Just as they'd sort of got the measure of V1s, another secret weapon came along called V2s. V2s were rockets. There's one in the Imperial War Museum in London, and it looks exactly like a sort of Tintin rocket, a cartoon of a rocket almost. Huge, about sort of 20 foot high. Um, and they were shot up into the air, um, again in, in German-held tel- territory. They went up into the strat- stratosphere, two miles high, I believe, and then they would drop down. And the thing about uh, V1s, was uh, V2s, were the, the rockets, were that... If you were underneath, you never heard them. So death would come instantly. You couldn't wait for them. Most people, if you weren't underneath, then you heard a crack and a boom somewhere else and the, the spreading pressure wave. If you were underneath them, you were probably dead. And the, there were two, three, four landing on London every day for, for months between about September and about March. Many of them, you know, they, they may have fallen in the river or they may have hit waste ground or they may have got lucky and exploded in the air. But nevertheless, destruction was incredible. And more than death, they also brought the most incredible destruction of property. So, so a V2 would not only raise a, a street beneath it, but would knock the roofs off about square half mile of housing. So... The devastation was incredible, and the dust and the noise and the misery. And meanwhile, rationing was at its worst, and um, the the winter of 44-45 was the coldest winter in living memory, and there were fuel shortages. So it was utterly miserable. People were slogging along and and having the most rotten time. And these uh, bombs particularly targeted London, so outside London, People didn't really understand quite how awful everything was. And, and in fact, when soldiers would come home on, on leave or perhaps be liberated from prison camps, they'd come back and they wouldn't be able to believe what was going on in London, what, what their relatives had, had suffered. So that's the, the scene at the beginning of the book. It's, it's victory is coming, but it's desperately slow. And we meet a young boy called Noel, who's um, nearly 15, who lives with someone he says is his aunt in a house in Hampstead Heath, a boarding house with several lodgers. In fact, she's not his aunt. They're not related in any way. And they've met in Crooked Heart. Um, and they, they, the plot of Crooked Heart is a little bit like Paper Moon in a way. They, they, they've been scammers. They've been ch- collecting for fake charities in Crooked Heart. Now they've gone respectable. They're living in a house in, in London trying to make ends meet and trying to stay under the radar because if anybody finds out who they actually are, then, then there might be trouble. So there's there's tension there and there's also um, house full of lodgers and, and uh, L- London, which is looking just dreadful. So that, that's, the, that's the mixture at the beginning. Lissa, I don't believe that you are old enough to have witnessed uh, World War II for yourself <laughs> as an adult. Not quite. Y- yet your your books and your description just talking to you um, is so vivid. Um, how did you prepare yourself to write this series, and and what did you do to get the not only the the um, the descriptions of places and and things like that correctly, but the the feeling um, you describe you describe the way people felt and uh, that description of you know the the cartoons of the 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 people with one big ear you know okay. those are those are details that that really get you know down to your marrow um, that make you feel like you're there. W- what do you do to prepare to to convey these the the setting and the feeling that people have so that when you sit down to write it just flows out of you i i research immersively but i research a lot uh, i 
a lot of contemporary accounts and there was a there was a thing called mass observation in uk which was set up uh before the war there was a young anthropologist called tom harrison who came back from papua new guinea having having spent a lot of time with tribes in papua new guinea writing down detailed observations about them and he came back to the uk and thought what if i did the same in britain isn't that what we need to do don't we need to see what 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 people are are, are doing and saying in the same amount of detail that we need to study ourselves and he set up a group called mass observation which would partly was asking people to keep diaries and send them on a monthly basis to a central office and partly observers would go out on particular days like the coronation of george the sixth and see what people were saying and doing and when the second world war began the ministry of information knew about tom harrison and they said carry on doing it because that will help us know what people are thinking, what people are saying, what is actually going on, what the morale is. So the mass, obs mass observation published various books. They, 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 they published a book about how people were living through the Blitz. They published diaries. They published detailed conversations. And these books are absolutely amazing. And they would turn up the most unexpected gems. For instance, you know, I was reading Living Through the Blitz. This was years ago now before I wrote my first uh, Second World War book and there's just a description of a young woman whose house has been bombed and she survives it's a big old mess and she goes to sleep with the neighbours that night she's given a blanket and told she's in shock but what she is actually feeling as she lies in bed is absolute euphoria because she survived she's thrilled she feels as if she's going to sort of burst through the roof and dance through the air because she she has survived this bomb and she gets on saying I, I, I'm alive I've been bombed and I'm alive. And I thought, well, gosh, what an extraordinary thing. That doesn't mean everybody felt like that, but one person felt like that. And therefore, many people will have felt like that. And that sort of unexpected moment is, is, is so important. But there's also descriptions that have been forgotten, of which you stumble across. So, you know, the sound of bombers, which, you know, we've all seen films, we've all seen footage of it. But I kept on coming across the description of bombers um, coming across saying, Oh, they had a stammering beat, a stuttering beat, the uneven throb of bombers. And I thought, well, what's, what's that about? And it turns out the German bombers had something called an unsynchronized engine. I don't know anything about that. But it meant that they had an uneven beat, which was noticed and which was sinister. And everyone at the time noticed it. And it's sort of been forgotten. And it's even in a Graham Greene novel. He talks about the bombers coming over, coming over the estuary. And it sounds as if they're saying, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And you think, God, that's the most amazing detail. And 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 so I pick up stuff like that. It's like it's like sort of you know pick, picking up beautiful leaves in autumn and pressing them and keeping them. And I don't necessarily use them, but they're there and they make me realise the range of what people spot and the and the unexpected reactions that you get. And also uh, uh, pick, I also you know pick up vocabulary as well. I I always odd words that are useful that people said at the time of vocabulary which might be unexpected so i've got lots of files on my computer with lots of different details in them but it's immersing oneself i think i could talk with, uh, for hours about this sorry well listen like we mentioned earlier v for victory is uh is the the uh the conclusion of this loose trilogy but it absolutely stands alone uh, uh on its own on it on its the the story is is completely self-contained um if someone is just coming to this um would you uh recommend that they go back and read um the other two books crooked heart uh and uh and i forget the name of the second I, one the old baggage I the old baggage old baggage it was on the tip of my tongue That's old baggage right. And and then uh, V for Victory, or um, or would you like for them to come in with this and then go back and read the other two? If anybody reads the book, I'm delighted, Hank, because you know, <laughs> if, I had, if I was able to instruct a reader, which we all want to do, don't we? I would say read Crooked Heart first, then read Old Baggage, then read V for Victory, which is the order I wrote them in. But but it really doesn't matter. And if you read V for Victory first and then go back to the others, you will discover things. And perhaps it will have a, a, a different sort of impact uh, that I haven't realised. And maybe it's better for all I know. So uh, there, there's the way I wrote them or there's any way you want to read them. Really. Right. 
Well, we'll put links to all three in the show notes of this episode so uh, readers can decide uh, how they want to enter the series. But however you do, uh, it will be a satisfying experience, I promise. Um, we're going to put links to these uh, in the show notes of this episode. Lissa, if if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do and connect with you, is there a place where they can do that online? Yes, there is. I've got a, I've got a website, LissaEvans.com. All one word, LissaEvans.com. Dot com and um that there's there's uh you could you can email me there or and there's li- there's links to my books and uh i think i think there's some notes on one book i haven't been keeping up to date as much as i should but nevertheless yes you can contact me there excellent we'll put links there as well for that listen this has been so much fun chatting thank you so much for taking time to come on the show and thank you hank for your lovely questions i really enjoyed it could have talked all night thank you Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started.